Okay, so maybe we should start. Um, so we covered the theory and saw how we get to the um, non, uh, very, very, very simple way of doing uh, waves on, a, on, at least on the beta plane. Um, and, and I think I said it in the last slide of, of yesterday's last slide, the ideas that were developed in, uh, on, in Cartesian coordinates can, for the most part, be adapted, not exactly transformed, but be adapted also in spherical coordinates. And this is what we're going to see on Friday. So it's a, in, on the sphere, they become much more complicated, but at least we have some guidelines how to deal with these monstrous equations. As you'll see, they are indeed monstrous. But today, I want to talk about a much simpler topic, and that is we talk about waves. And I think at the end of yesterday, Matana Benazzi was talking about, do you see them if you fly? Are there any? How do you observe them? Is it relevant to anything beyond applied mathematics, say, or something like that? And the answer is, Yes, we observe uh, ocean, but the observations in the ocean, especially of waves in the ocean, is to observe it. The act of it is very, very, very difficult, especially when it comes to the interesting waves. We can see, as you saw in the um, opening opening slide, we can see waves on the beach. You know, they break, and we see the white. Uh, foam forming on them, and, and we can see lots of waves uh, as we go up and down in, in the surface of the ocean, and we can even observe easily the tides, you know, that go up and down. Maybe we need a little more sophistication than just looking at the waves, you know, from, from a dock, but we're talking here about Rossby waves or planetary waves. They are very, 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 very slow. They move slowly. They go up and down and up and down in matters of months, maybe years even. So how do you observe them? That's the first question. And I think the second immediate question will be, how accurate are those observations, especially for a theoretician like, I think, me, and I'll exclude, exclude Arthur, all the rest of us, you know, we, we try to tailor the theory to fit observations. And you say, once you have a point and say, oh, this is five, you say, we have to come up with the five in those circumstances. And it turns out that if you join the bunch of observation lists, the five can be easily four or six, or maybe even three and seven. So uh, what I'm saying is there, it, it's a bridge of knowledge that comes you know, from what are the actual facts and what are the actual theories, et cetera, et cetera. And, and, Somehow we're trying to bridge, cross that uh, gap between them. So today I'm talking about um, um, observations and especially the match. Again, we have now two theories and we want to match the two theories with observations. So we have the harmonic theory and we have the trapped wave theory. And the question is, that it's more accurate mathematically, consistent. We can, you know, tap on the shoulder and say, plop. This is accurate and consistent and, wow, great. But the question is, does it matter to the average oceanographer or to the physical oceanographer who goes out to sea? And in that respect, there is, um, I think, one of the forefathers of physical oceanography, Henry Stommel. He, uh, many, many, many of the great fundamental ideas in physical oceanography uh, are due to uh, Henry Stommel, the late Henry Stommel, very... Um, productive, uh, creative, and, and uh, scientist who could really see the wood for the trees, never bothered with the equations. And yeah, he could handle equations a little bit, but, it was, but his physical insight was tremendous. Um, it, it's a pleasure to read his book on the Coriolis force. It's a very thin book that he wrote on the Coriolis force. And if you read it, by the end, you say, wow, I learned something. You know, it's not easy to say about uh, everything you read. So uh, we want to match a theory. And, and look, uh, at the end, I'll show you two theories and observations and let you decide which is better. I'm telling you the secret. The trapdoor theory works better. 
but um, when when Henry Stommel talked about it in 1954, it's it's interesting to to read what he wrote. Again, he's not a theoretician or or ma mathematician. Too much of the theory parameters of ocean circulation has depended upon purely hypothetical physical processes. Uh, many of the hypotheses suggested have peculiar dreamlike quality. And it's true, <laughs> OK? Dreamlike can be either from a theoretical viewpoint or the physical viewpoint. You know, we don't know how to solve it. We do some approximation. And it behooves us to submit them to a special scrutiny and to test them by observations. And it's true, we have to do accurate observations and to do accurate uh, or as accurate as we can theories, at least to claim the order correctly, or the, the order of the accuracy. So with this in mind, that observations are inaccurate, or not 100%, never 100% accurate, and the theories suffers, all theories suffer from some sort of expansion issues or accuracy, but at least in a good theory, we can tell you how accurate it is. What is the level of inaccuracy? Let's proceed and see what we can say about matching of a theory with observations. So um, what I'll, I'll talk to you about in, in this context is uh, we need to find a place in which really the theories can be examined. And we need to find, um, remember in our theory, um, the, the trapped waves need at least an equatorial boundary, equatorial word directly, not equatorial, but uh, what we call in the, south, in the northern hemisphere, the southern wall. In the southern hemisphere, it's going to be the northern wall. It's the last time I'm saying it because I'm going to get confused. So it's, it's equatorial word boundary of, but we don't need the other one. The pole word boundary, we don't need. So, uh, so we need some sort of a coast that goes east-west, more or less, right? Um, whoops. And um, um, it has to be, you know, if, if it's one point, uh, there's not going to be much to see. So we need to be, like, of a certain width. Um, and uh, the domain will have to be large enough meridionally for the theory to apply. And observations that are sufficiently long so that the averaging covers up for the inherent inaccuracy in the observations themselves, okay? So the observations are far from perfect, and the only savior in, in, savior in this um, observational arena is the fact that you have many, many, many observations. You average them, you know, in, in probably more than just one, one direction, then it's gonna give you some useful information. So, um, and, and we don't want to have currents in the area because currents will interfere with the waves. Okay, so we're talking about comparison of wave theories to observations. So uh, it turns out that one such great place is the Indian Ocean just south, south of Australia. Why is it so? Because uh, it, it's sufficiently wide. Australia is at least something like 15 degrees of uh, longitude, if you go east-west, right, 15, 1,500 kilometers, maybe more. Um, and, and there is um, satellite observations that cover the area, and maybe we can use them to uh, um, um, observe Rossby waves, those low frequency that are not very fast, like they're not interesting to anyone, those gravity waves or super gravity waves. And they uh, propagate in the thermocline. I'll return to this point in just a few slides. So if you don't understand me, I'll give you more details in, in like three minutes. So the idea is that since the uh, early 1990s, okay, maybe 1991, there have been satellites that were hovering at an altitude of about 1,000 kilometers above Earth give and take a few hundred, a few hundred kilometers, um, and measuring the travel time of, of a, uh, a ray, radar that they send to below them 
and the back and forth travel time can give them an estimate. They know the speed and the difference in time, the time it takes for it, give them a, a, um, a, an estimate of the distance of the reflecting surface from the satellite. So, so it's like I'm shining it, it comes back to me, I can tell you what the distance between, between me and the wall is, okay? Just quick, you, you, the millisecond, microsecond that it takes the, the ray to come back and forth, I can tell you the distance. In particular, we're talking about the ocean. Uh, we're interested in the ocean, not mapping mountains on, on land, etc. And um, there, there, by now, there are many, many, many such satellites. I'll talk a little bit about the idea, basic idea, not about a particular satellite. So the satellite itself talks to GPS satellites that are geochronous, and, and therefore they are much higher, but it communicates with them easily and, and straightforwardly. And since it communicates with several GPS satellites, the location, three-dimensional, both in space, in, in uh, horizontal space, and in height above the ground, can be determined very accurately. Okay, so the three-dimensional location, the exact location of the satellite itself, is done by uh, both GPS, and they also have some calibration with um, station, ground-bound stations. And we can know this location very, very accurately, okay? This is the orbit of the satellite. And it, as, it, as it shines this radar ray downwards, it can take the travel time and decipher from it what the distance is to the sea surface. Now, the sea surface varies for a lot of reasons. Number one, um, just surface waves, you know, that are a few minutes, there are wind waves, there are tides that take one, you know, 12 hours or so to go up and down. There are many, many variations. But the thing is the satellite goes around Earth uh, around, uh, goes around, yeah, like this, every 90 minutes or so. I'm not exactly sure whether the number is the same with more modern satellites, but it takes order of between one and two hours. So uh, it completes um, a revolution, or it completes about 16 revolutions about Earth, okay, in, in one day. And it repeats the exact same point. You understand what I'm when I what I mean? It goes like this around Earth. It's not the exact same path, but it just goes change the great circle relative to Earth. Are you all with me? And did I have okay? And it takes about ten days, or if you will, 160 passes. Is it 16 passes per day? And you take 10 days is about 160 passes for the satellite to return to the same point. So like this, every 10 days, it, you have, okay, another point, another measurement. And of course, it's not very, very accurate, but as you see, the end result is extremely accurate. Let me just talk a little bit about the complications. It, so the complication is that it goes this way. There is a mean sea surface that's determined by many, many, many factors. And the mean sea surface is um, affected by the uh, reference ellipsoid of Earth. Then there is a distribution of mass of rocks, and whether it's very heavy rocks like um, magma and basalt, and very soft rocks like um, limestone, etc. So the distribution of the Geoid relative to the reference is also has to be mapped accurately. And then, of course, there is there are currents in the ocean that cause a tilt in the surface of the ocean. But when they filter all that out, and it's not that easy, but they do it, they get the mean sea surface height and the what we call the deviations or the anomalies. Okay, the anomalies is nothing that's anomalous, it's just at that point, it can be high above the mean or below the mean sea surface. Okay. Um, th there's a lot of work that goes into it. And in, in, um, since there, there is so much data now that actually it's, um, 
um, it started as a US uh, France collaboration. Um, it originated, I think, with OPEX, which I think was uh, the American, and Poseidon, which was the French, and, and, and some of the combined forces. And now it's Aviso, which is, don't ask me what it stands for, advanced, very something. But now the, all the data is managed in one big place. And you can log in and just get any, any data that you want. So, so now the data is freely available from all those passes that scan the changes in sea surface height. OK. Um, so the deviation from the mean is what we're after. Okay, If the sea surface just goes this way or that way, is of less interest to us. The up and down motion is of interest to us. And um, this is one picture, just a very colorful. So I thought of most of my graphs are boring. You know, blah, maybe dash. That's it. This is really, you see colors, you see arrows, you see something happening here. OK, so this is the South Pacific. You see how you can identify very clearly an eddy. And an eddy in the ocean is like a hurricane or a low system in the atmosphere. It's the weather. Okay, things that don't live very, very long, but they live long enough for the satellite to observe them. Um, and, and the arrows are interpolation of the motion of this center of this eddy as it moves in the, in the South Pacific. Okay, so this is uh, Brazil and then Argentina, and this is Antarctica. OK, uh, so we can, we can measure it. And actually, if you now, nowadays, you can actually talk to several satellites. And instead of getting a snapshot from one satellite, you can make a composite snapshot. And there is really a lot of data that's stored in there. And the data, as I said, is freely available. You can all take it and do with it whatever you want. And once you do it, once you, are, you have access to the data, I'm showing you one of the first figures that came out in the 1990s. I think it's 1996, maybe. Yeah. So what we do, one of the major tools that helps us process the data is to say, OK, we're now, it's, it's we have x uh, height as a function of longitude, latitude, and time, of course. OK, so now what do we do with it? Okay, So the answer is that what we can do, again, in relation to waves now, I'm not talking about sea surface height, but waves that disturb the height of the surface. I'm going to tell you in a few slides how exactly it disturbs the surface. But think about. In, in your mind, just waves, you know, they disturb the surface, change the anomaly, okay, affect the anomaly. So what we can do is we can say, ah, we'll take a certain latitude, okay, like 22, 22 degrees north. It's a latitude. And on that latitude, we can now form a series made up of time and longitude, okay? So um, the sea surface height at a given latitude as a function of longitude on the abscissa and latitude on the, uh, and, I'm sorry, and time on the ordinate. Okay, so this is a fixed latitude. And we just plot the data, simply plot the numbers we get uh, on, on, this, uh, on this matrix. Okay, uh, and what we see is there is you know, zero, and there is high, and there is low, and low, uh, and high, and low, and high. Okay? Red is when it's up, the surface going up. And blue, deep blue, is when it goes down. And as you see, the signal is not huge. It's a few centimeters. And this is a good example where everyone can see those highs and lows. And remember, each of these lines is a, a day, a, a, a measurement, okay, a time. This is 100 days, 200 days. This is three years of data, I think, yeah. Three years of data, so three is 1,000 days. And, okay, so here you have lots of measurements in, in, in terms of time. And again, you do it with, uh, uh, as a function of longitude, and now you see crests and troughs of of sea surface anomaly, sea surface height anomaly. Okay, so 
if you, if you were there on that day, it would be high here, low here, high here, low here, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Okay. You realize that there is a wave in time and in longitude. Okay? It goes, if you go this way, it's not exactly periodic, but it's very similar to a wave or approximate by a wave. And if you go this way, in other words, at a certain latitude as a function of time, you can also see that there is a frequency, maybe not very dominant, maybe not uniform over the entire domain, but there are very clear lines of equal phase. Okay? So if you follow equal phase of the sea surface height anomaly, then you can see a slope on this diagram which is nothing but the time or, or, or longitude time plot, and it's called Hofmuller diagram. Who's Dutch here? Hofmuller? I'll tell you what, 99% of those who use the method Hofmuller diagram don't know what the characteristics are. Trust me. <laughs> I think I know what you mean. It's not the characteristics in English, it's the characteristics in PDEs. Oceanographers don't know what you're talking about. They can characterize a ship, they can characterize the state of the sea, but characteristics in terms of line of propagation, discontinuity, forget it. In any event, but you are right, it's, it's the same idea. You can you plot on T and X with lines of equal phase but um, uh, so, so, okay, so we know there is a wave. And the interesting thing is if you think, if your interest is only in the phase speed of the wave, then think about the slope. The slope here is delta t over delta x or delta lambda, right? At a certain latitude, it's a, it's a fixed latitude, delta x and delta lambda are easily connected by the cosine of this 22 degrees, okay? So the slope here is nothing but the dt dx along the line. And if you invert it, it becomes dx dt, which is exactly what we call speed or phase speed. Okay, are you all with me? So somehow we measured terabytes of sea surface height anomalies, and suddenly we get an estimate of a wave. The data tells us you have here lines of equal phase, almost equal phase, and that equal phase travels in the x direction at a certain speed that can be calculated from the slope of these equi-phase lines. Okay? Okay. And just pay attention. As I said, the satellite hovers around 1,000 kilometers from Earth's surface. It doesn't really matter whether it's 1,300 or 800. It's 10 to the eighth centimeters, while the resolution here is about a few centimeters. So it's literally 10 to the minus eight resolution. You want three tenths to the minus eight, minus eight, fine, but it's a very impressive resolution. And again, if you just flew over it, or over the Atlantic with a plane, there's no chance in hell you'll see it. But when you average many, many years of data, et cetera, et cetera, and someone calibrates the um, AVHRR, the, the radar on board of the satellite, then somehow you get to see uh, those inferences or those inferred phase speeds of a wave. So very slowly, see it covered maybe just an estimate from here to here, it's about 20 degrees of longitude, 20, say about maybe 2,000 kilometers in about three years. Let's just give you an uh, estimate of the numbers we're talking about. Okay, so what exactly are those waves? Or what's the best interpretation of what we see? And the ocean generally um, has... And I'll, I'll start earlier. In the ocean, the changes in density are very, very tiny. 
compared with the atmosphere. The atmosphere changes density much, much more abruptly than in the ocean because temperature affects the atmosphere much more than the ocean. And because the ocean, because the atmosphere has a very small density and um, large thermal expansion coefficient. If you heat it a little bit, like 10 degrees, it blows up tremendously, whereas the water in the ocean change very slightly. But still, those small changes, order of 10 to the minus 3 in density, like 1 in 1,000, are very, very important for the currents and, and because G is very large. Allow me to, to end this physical oceanography part here. If you now look, divide the ocean into two main vertical sections, there is a top layer of the ocean that we uh, attach to the surface and actually can somehow feel the radiation from the sun, okay? Absorbs the solar radiation, gets somehow in contact with the world outside the ocean. And below that, the water is divorced from the from direct contact with the atmosphere. It does get somehow water that were in contact with the atmosphere at some particular places. It's not entirely isolated, but for practical issues of day to day or year to year, it do doesn't feel directly the effect of the atmosphere. And here, the water is even more uniform in density than here. Okay? And the surface that separates these two, I don't want to say hypothetical here, but they're very prominent, but it's not of uniform depth. It can be one depth in the Mediterranean, another depth in, in the Nordic seas or Atlantic seas, or it can even change um, seasonally at some places. But there is definitely a, a place, uh, a, a level uh, at which you start feeling that the density hardly changes because the temperature hardly changes. And basically, salinity is almost the same everywhere. And if salinity and temperature are identical, then the pressure, then the uh, uh, density, or at least potential density, would be uh, constant. So here, constant. Here, somehow variable because it's being heated. And since it's warmer, it can also release the heat to the atmosphere. So there is some more thermodynamics that occurs here above the thermocline, the level called the thermocline. And above it, again, there is direct contact with the sun. And below it, it's only indirect, like water that sank in the polar regions and somehow made a very, very slow passage to lower latitudes. Yes. Yeah, that's, that's why I said the word potential. <laughs> the, the water is, okay, I'll take one minute to answer it. Um, water is not incompressible up to the fifth decimal digit. Okay. Its compressibility is very, very low. How low? It might be a little, something like maybe a few percent denser at the bottom of the ocean compared with the value at the surface. But most of it comes from the pressure. It just, you have, you know, the pressure at the bottom of the ocean is probably something like hundreds of atmospheres, 400 atmospheres or 400 bars. And that, that's very, very <laughs> pressure, huge pressure. And of course, it manages to squeeze the mass of water into a shorter or smaller volume, even, even though the water is very, very slightly, or very slightly um, um, compressible. But this part of the compressibility is easily taken out because you know that each 10 meters of water equals to about one atmosphere in pressure. So that's small. Can, is a small change in density due to pressure can be easily calculated out. And we can calculate the density that the water parcel here will have if you bring it up to the surface 
adiabatically, okay? So just release the pressure. Don't let any temperature, any heat or salt get in there. And just bring it to the surface. Take out the pressure. And you know that it will expand a little bit so you know what the, we call that the potential temperature. Okay? And, and we can easily compute that. It's, it's, it's small, but yet much larger than what we're talking about here. The rest of it comes from the fact that you heat it up, and you heat it up, suddenly you make it a little less dense. Okay? Okay, so there are waves that propagate in the thermocline which we cannot see and are very difficult to observe. And the thought is that if you have a wave at the thermocline, it's inconceivable that you'll feel it. This is, by the way, not drawn to scale. The thermocline is maybe 200 meters, order 200, maybe 100 in some places. Maybe in other places it could be more than, than 200, maybe 500. But the depth of the ocean is, is measured in kilometers. Okay, so think about four, five, six kilometers. It's inconceivable that what you have here will really affect what's going at, at great depths. Okay? Therefore, in order to cancel it, there has to be a motion at the sea surface that balances it. Now, which balances what is doesn't matter to us. Okay? If it's surface uh, undulation that are compensated by the thermocline or vice versa, it doesn't matter to us, as long as the two of them live together. Okay? So the surface and the thermocline move somehow in concert with one another, such that at great depths, there is no pressure change. There are no pressure changes in pressure. Okay? If you live at the depth of five kilometers or four kilometers, you won't see any storm that you know ha happens five kilometers above you. And therefore, what you see at the surface is a reflection of what happens in the thermocline, or again, vice versa. It doesn't make a difference. And therefore, the speed we can calculate now the speed of waves based on this two-layer system, if you will. I won't go through the details. This is not my subject, okay? I'm just giving you a background, okay? And if you now go and say, okay, and in the 1990s, all we knew was the harmonic way of uh, doing stuff or, or harmonic wave theory, here are two papers um, from early, one in 1990s, around 2000, so 20 some years ago. And what you see here, let's take the uh, right one, is many, many, many points. Again, remember, there, these are, at each latitude, you have those diagrams, okay? Those hov molly diagrams. And you now you can do it in one ocean, you could do it in another ocean. So let's look at this one. You see you have solid circles come from the Pacific Ocean, the largest ocean in the world, and the open circles come from the Atlantic and Indian Oceans, okay? <clears throat> there is no big difference between them. You just, you might, but back then they didn't know that and they just plotted everything they knew as much information. But you see generally that the diff if this is the theoretical depth, and this, I'm sorry, the theoretical phase speed you expect at that latitude, except for the immediate vicinity of the equator, all data or all phase speeds lie above that line. This is very obvious in, 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 in this data, okay? Except for the immediate vicinity of the equator in which the formula of, of phase speed changed drastically. It's not the same at all. So you see that in so far as the mid-latitude dynamics, may, perhaps all points maybe north of 10 or maybe 15 degrees latitude fall above that line. Above the, by the theoretical line, i.e., move faster. Okay, they move faster than the theoretical lines. Okay, so maybe uh, to draw a conclusion from this, to say that the observed phase speed of the low frequency, low phase speed waves, of which we know only of Rossby waves, is higher than the theoretical one based on the harmonic theory. Are you with me so far? No, you don't agree. Why? What did I say wrong? 
Okay. You agree with me? I'm fine. Democracy rules. Uh, by the way, another uh, uh, study found more or less the same thing. Here is the uh, actual, uh, uh, <clears throat> uh, th this is the actual phase speed. And you see there's a huge error bar. Look, look at the error bar. It's not so easy to discern the value, even though there are many more years now than they had in 1996. It's ordered 10 years that they've analyzed. Yeah, there, is still, there are still large error bars. Each dot, each point has large error bars. But still, if you look at the ratio, it falls. This is the ratio of this. Okay, so the ratio of this point to that is plotted here, but it's tilted. Okay, so one is the theoretical, theoretical speed. Or, and you see that north of, say, 15 degrees, it's always above one reaching a very large number of maybe two or three at 40 degrees. But the idea is that the first measurements of Rossby waves, again, low frequency waves, the only wave we know is Rossby waves. The others are way, 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 way too fast. Okay? And they all originate, they all seem to indicate faster than theoretical phase speed. And there are many, many more articles that don't want to bore you that, you know, analyzed here and there. And so this is the state of the art. And here's a brief summary. They examined, of course, assuming that N equals zero and K equals zero. They did almost all the sins we talked about in the theoretical part, but that's what they did, okay? And, uh, um, oops. That's not what I meant. I meant this. Oops, sorry. Okay. And um, remember what the conclusion from the theoretical analysis I showed you on day one was that if you adopt the trapped wave theory, then the phase speed is larger. Okay? Theoretically, if you just calculate the two formulae, you get higher phase speed, faster moving waves, in the trapped wave theory compared to the harmonic wave theory. So without going into details, I'll go into more details in a minute, but I would say the observational evidence as say 10 years ago or so, indicates that the trapped wave theory has relevance to observations, perhaps more, maybe a little more than the harmonic wave theory. One other thing I want to say is that for reasons which are, have to do with the observations, they found it very difficult to follow the amplitude. In the harmonic wave theory, if you take the n equals zero mode, remember what I said yesterday, I think. The n equals zero mode is not at all a solution of the equations because then the sign Ly becomes sine ny becomes zero, and you have v equals zero if you have two walls and you want them v to be to, to be zero and it's constant to be zero at two points and it's constant, then it has to be zero everywhere. So there was no hope of analyzing the amplitude, the change, the amplitude structure, if all you have in your hands is the harmonic theory, because the n equals zero doesn't have any amplitude. In, in fact, we can say mathematically, it doesn't have any solution. It's meaningless to put a number in there. You can, but it's meaningless, number n equals zero. And uh, so they ignored the structure of the amplitude, which could have been a distinguishing factor between the two theories, simply because they, it couldn't handle the harmonic wave theory. So what do I want to say now? I want to go back and tell you that there is one region in the world which is on the one hand large enough, both zonally, so we don't have like one point or two points like you can find in isolated islands. Remember, the data itself has some, you know, some width of, of, of a point. It's not actually one point. The one point represents now I think half a degree, so it's about 50 kilometers resolution. So you need to have 
several points uh, along, and you know, want it to be large enough meridionally, this way it's going south, where this is uh, Antarctica, so that we can distinguish the decay of the amplitude in, in the airy or trapped wave theory. Okay? So if you zoom in on this region, this is what you see, okay? Some from 30 something, again, in, in math, by the way, Jean-Pierre, in math, every line is a straight line. No straight lines in geography, forget it. But it's as close as we come, okay? And, and, and we can tailor it to that point and, and go from here to there. Remember, we really don't care that much about where the poleward wall is, it, if, whether it's 13 degrees or whether it's 11 degrees, doesn't make much difference. Again, when it comes to the to the area, to the trapped wave theory. The waves are trapped near the coast. So this is the area, and again, since the coverage, okay, so it has about 10 degrees uh, wide, okay, something like, believe me, it's 10 degrees, uh, and it has a wall, of course, that we have to vanish here, and the region extends, as you see, something like maybe 13, 14 uh, degrees uh, north-south, and, and there are no major currents. So there is very little we can attribute to currents in the variations. It's a very still uh, body of water. Okay, so what do we do? We take 20 years. We took 20 years of this uh, Topix Poseidon and then Jason. The satellites wear out, like, like us. Okay? We wear out. At a certain point, we find it hard to walk. At a certain point in life, I don't know, something happens. And so do satellites, and they burn out. And what you see, so they're replaced and they're calibrated in those establishments that take care of the motion of, of the um, continuity of the da data. So here you can see a number of, this is Topics Poseidon that started the whole thing, then it became Jason 1. Then so I, I, the, the names, yeah. Okay, and there are other satellites, and there are probably many, many, many that they missed. All I'm saying is by now, or at least in up to five, six years ago, we've had much more data. Again, the Aviso, the guys who take care of it, had much more data, and they, of course, put it in on a fixed grid on the world and take care, care of the boundaries, and all that is being done for us, okay? We don't have to deal with it. Think about someone giving you a whole load of data, and you can just have just have to work with it. So we took about twenty years, yes, and um, they are done here. This is a visa. This is the CNES, the Center National Etude Spatiale, CNES, and NASA, which is National Administration for what sciences? Space, space. National Air and Space, Air and Space Administration, right? National Air and Space Administration, okay. Uh, uh, and, and they make, they do all, all the stuff for us. So we took, say, 1993 from 2013. Um, and, and they have now one-fourth of long lat degree, longitude latitude, and they have 24 hours resolution. Again, they combined all the satellites and they can now give you data that is uh, in, in this spatial resolution and, 20, and, and temporal resolution. So if you have day, we took 35 day averages, I think, if I remember correctly, yeah, five weeks, 35 days averages. <laughs> so just average everything you want and we average, we average it uh, in time and in longitude and this is what we got, okay? So, what you see here is this is the coast of Australia, okay? That 10 degrees I talked about longitude. And what you see here, or you, you look at this first. You see here that there is uh, uh, there are what, about 10 degrees longitude and it's one fourth of a degree. So there are about 40 profiles of sea surface height, again, averaged over the entire period of 20 years out of daily measurements and, and the um, average over 35 days, 
In short, you see, these are the individual profiles. Okay, so you have one profile here, one here, one here. And all of them carry this signature of being very much in higher amplitude near the coast. And this is the average of all of these. Okay, so the dark blue line is the average of all these 41, I think we had 41 cross sections. Okay, so individual cross sections. And what you see here is that the amplitude really obeys much, uh, much more closely the theoretical line in red of the trapped wave theory than the theoretical line of the harmonic wave theory, which is actually a constant. If n equals zero, then nothing happens, so eta should be constant. If you just go, if V is constant, you go to the eta eigenfunction. So this is the first time that the amplitude of the sea surface size anomaly was gauged to distinguish between the two theories. Okay? And again, there's nothing you can do here in the harmonic theory. So this is insofar as the amplitude is concerned. This is the major difference. I mean, the difference in phase speeds is quantitative. The difference in amplitude structure is qualitative in the sense that the harmonic wave theory just tells you it's going to be zero, whereas the, um, this is a very certain, a very not simple, but very clear structure that we said for these bumps is really um, reinforced or, or validated by, by the observations. But I want to go now into a more difficult task, and that is to try and compare the phase speeds. And as I told you, the phase speeds, you have to come up with those Hofmuller diagrams, and there is a whole industry of how to correctly infer those lines in pictures that are not as clear or as, as good as what I showed you. What I showed you was an exemplary way, or exemplary case in which it's very, everyone sees those lines. There are many, many, many cases in which you come up with it, you look at it and you say, I hardly see anything. And this is actually the more prevalent uh, result is you look at it and you say, I can't see anything. And you need somewhat a more objective way of trying to decipher the dominant uh, phase speeds, or if you will, omega k, on these Hofmuller diagrams and just your eyes. Okay? So let's continue and see what happens. So uh, see, this is already a somewhat less of an impressive uh, uh, diagram. You, have, you see here almost. 20 years from January to December, so it's 30 years of, uh, of data. And you see here latitude of what? Uh, along 45 degrees south, OK? And um, now it becomes more of a guesswork to tell which is the dominant one. Do you agree with me? It's, it's, you see that there is structure, but it's hard to come up with a number. I mean, I'm not talking mathematics. I'm talking about the eyes of a scientist. You, you realize that they all slope something like this, so we know it's going westward, and we know that, um, OK. So what we can do is we can put the two theoretical lines. Remember, we have now two theories, OK? And for the parameters that the, uh, are, are at play, we can now put the two theoretical lines. I put them here and here, uh, and, and uh, gauge which one. Now remember, this is lines on an x and t. So the phase speed is the inverse of the slope, right? Because the slope gives you the t dx, but we want the speed, which is dx dt. Are you with me? I'm Okay, so this one, okay, the dashed one, which has a lower slope, has a higher phase speed, okay? And this one is simply the 
um, uh, the, the trapped wave theory, and this is the harmonic wave theory. And just by looking at it with your eyes, you can tell this is somewhat better than this in this not so easily to decipher figure, Hofmuller diagram. When I say figure, I mean the Hofmuller diagram. Actually, you are Dutch, right? You know Dutch? No? Hofmuller, how do you pronounce it? How do you, how do you okay, you don't know. I thought it's, it's Hof, Hofmuller? Okay. Oh, German? Okay. Sorry. Um, in any event, in, I, I thought Homono was, uh, oh, oh, okay. Uh, in any event, um, so the idea is that we try and do the hard job of maybe deciphering in the, in the next maybe 20 minutes, the hard, not, not 20, less than that, the, the phase speed, again, in a more systematic manner, not just looking at some picture in which you can see something, looking at pictures in which we can apply an objective method and get the phase speed objectively, not some, something that suits the developer of a new theory. Okay, so there are several ways of doing it. Of course, the, whenever you hear that there are several ways of doing it, you understand the reason. Why isn't there one way of doing it? Because none of the, wor of the ways is sufficiently accurate or satisfactory. Okay, so we, we, we want phase speeds, and the phase speed is nothing but the frequency over the wave number. So we can do several things. I'll, 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 I won't go into the details. Each one of them is the whole industry of, of what you do. I'm, I'm just giving you highlights or, or basic ideas. The first one is uh, uh, called the uh, uh, radon transform method, in which, uh, by the way, it's used in tomography in, in medicine. So whenever you get results that you do not have tumor or you do, not, do have tumor, it's usually someone uses the radon transform. Radon is not the gas, by the way, it's the name of the person. And the idea is that you select a certain uh, coordinates and look at the change in the phase on that plane, okay? In, in, in our case, it's P and X on that plane for the change in uh, uh, the mean, um, um, uh, okay. Uh, change in the mean values, okay, in, uh, across different angles. So you come from different angles to a certain point or a certain region, and you gauge uh, uh, how uh, accurate you can, uh, you can determine the slope based, again, on, on the changes that occur in the mean value. Uh, the second system is very similar, but instead of gauging the mean value, you gauge the variance, okay? And that also can be used to identify the sharp edges of a region which suddenly you get a change. The third one, I think, is a, this is, it's really a whole industry of how to do it. Allow me to stop at what I said, okay? It's, I don't wanna go into it. The third one, I think, is a little more intuitive in the sense that it's not any better let me tell you, but it's more intuitive. You say, you want to know omega over k, so why did you um, calculate omega along the t-axis and x on the x, and, x, and k on the x-axis and just take one over the other? The thing is, it's not so easy because um, you want the ratio and neither of them is accurate. So. How do you determine the average ratio or the fa typical phase speed? So you can have two, two uh, ways of doing it. You can either determine a maximum amplitude and, and the maximum in wave number and frequency space. So omega and k 
in which you have the maximum amplitude, just take the ratio of them, or you can take, uh, if you take it, you look at the omega k line and you pass the best fitting line and take the slope of that line in omega k space. The reason there are so many ways of doing it because none of them works very well. Okay, they work okay when the signal is clear, but when the signal is a little blurred, it's not so easy to see it. Okay, uh, let me show you, even though I said so, that uh, we, we tried to uh, take an artificial system of which we know the omega k and c and mask it okay, to gauge which of the methods works best. And so we took, you see here, it's very easy to see. We took wave number uh, uh, sine kx minus omega t, basically. Okay? So we know what the k, and we took more than one k, more, more than one omega. But we know what the amplitudes are. Okay? So we know which waves we put in. And then we masked it with a horrific bunch of, of noise. So this is... From here, you can see nothing, okay? But the generator knows exactly what dominant frequencies and dominant Cs are. Okay, never mind what they are, but all I'm telling you is we take something that we know exactly what happens there, mask it completely with noise, very large amplitude noise like we have in the ocean, and say, ah, you know what? Let's see if one of these methods can decipher it or can detect correctly. And, and the answer is this is, um, uh, all of them do an okay job. You see, here we have, uh, in the Raven transform, we have the dominant one here, and we take the, the third one, it doesn't detect at all. Okay, so we only had three frequencies, it detects one fine, and then if you take now um, the variance, I think it's very similar to that. This, I think, is the variance. And if you do the FFT, you get one of them accurately and the other two don't. So what I'm saying to you is, look, if you put each of these methods to the test, okay, you know what the results are, and you say, show me that you can do the job. In reality, none of these, of these methods can give you the correct answer to 100%. But if you want to be a little more forgiving, all of them give you the dominant one okay. You remember, we had three, okay? So the dominant one is okay. And the others, you know, between two and three, it, it's hard to tell where, which one of them is best, but all I'm saying is it's imperfect, but it has something, each of these methods is imperfect, far from perfect but it has some value, okay? So the way to maximize the value is to say, look, in the real data, in the real data, what we will do is we'll declare a C <coughs> only if two methods agree, at least two of these three methods agree. And the question now, what does it mean to agree? 1% to 10%, within 10%. So there is a lot of subjectivity in it. But we will accept a determination based on at least the agreement between at least two of the three methods. Okay? And um, uh, if, it, if, if neither, if only one of them finds a signal, again, in the real data, not, not artificial data, then we're not going to hand. We're not going to deal with it. Okay. Um, so uh, we, we could do two and maybe three. One or two with the uh, variant. You, you could maybe make it four if you're hard pressed to do it. Uh, but they can be ten percent or maybe twelve or twenty-five percent, depending on how forgiving you want to be about the difference between the two methods, okay, or two of the methods that see a signal there. Was that? Okay. 
Uh, so this choice of, you know, 10, 12, or 25% agreement, okay, so two of the methods agree to within, say, 25. They say C equals 1, and the other one says 1.1. 1 .1. We say, okay, so this is the same. But if one says 1 and the other one says 1.5, we'll say, no, this is not an agreement. Okay? Um, okay, so at least two of the methods agree to within some prescribed accuracy. So this is the end result. Okay, so this is the longitude. Remember, Australia, we have moved a little bit away from the coast, so we have all of them. And in that range from 35 to 45, 45 says all of, almost touching the ACC. And what you see here uh, plotted is, or I'll start with the theoretical lines. This line gives you the phase speed that we anticipate from the uh, uh, trapped wave theory. So you have one latitude that you have to fix, and with that, all the waves travel with a formula I gave you a few days ago. Okay, like I think it was on Monday. This is what happens if you do the classical harmonic wave theory at the latitude of observation. Remember that when they asked at, with the n equals zero, there is no meridional variation. You ask yourself, what happens at that latitude? The only thing you can go by is the beta and f at that latitude. Okay? So it varies with latitude monotonically. Okay? The higher latitude, the lower the phase speed. Okay, so far. And here, what you see is what we determine to be the points, observations. Now, there is a large scatter, and, and you see here in circles, we have the points where at least two of the methods agree to within 10%. Okay? And as you see there, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. Not very many, unfortunately. Uh, if you look at the uh, uh, triangles here, green triangles, and, and you are forgiving 12% difference in the estimate, then you see two more. And if you agree to take 25, you get maybe all, all those squares. So you get all together, if you agree to 25%, you accept 25 degrees difference, you realize that there are I don't know, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, maybe 15 or so points. Okay, not all points, not everywhere. So we, we are comparing several methods, and we find out that they usually, on average, don't agree very well with one another. Okay? But there are locations in which the signal, again, the Hofmuller diagram and, and the an analysis on it, based on either dimensional for fast Fourier transform or radon on the variance or radon on the mean values and they agree only about in, in 15 out of the we had there about um, maybe 20 something data points because they are 30 something to 45 it's divided multiplied by two it's about 25 or so so only 15 out of 25 or maybe 30 but Given that you accept, it doesn't really make a big difference which criteria you accept. If you just take all of them, okay, 25 degree criteria, you see that the sum of squares of deviation from this line is about 3.5, whereas here is about five times that. So there is a significant improvement, again, in the noisy data and the unrealistic not unrealistic, I shouldn't say again, in the very, um, not very accurate way of analyzing the highly variable or high noise data, you see here that this does a much better job, again, with all the caveats of imperfection of, of data analysis. Um, so the data we used was until 2013, it might be, sensible to return to it, say, a year or two from now, and find out maybe there are uh, more accurate measurements, say, since then, maybe the 10 years that elapsed since 2013, 
or is somewhat got some more data, and maybe the data now can be analyzed a little more accurately. I haven't, uh, I don't think I'll do it, but who knows. Okay, I think uh, it concludes the uh, first part of my lecture. Um, the current, current methods, I don't know how to phrase it. You can phrase it any way you want. The current methods for detecting West propagation surface height signals are not very accurate. So you can say they are highly inaccurate or just inaccurate, or what I said are not very accurate, choose and pick your words, not sufficient, sufficiently convincing, especially for mathematicians, right? I mean, Rampia is looking at them. What happens with them? Can they do something right? Um, um, so what, as I said, what we did is we take out of the three, four methods, we take agreement between at least two of them. Okay, so at least two of them agree to within either 10 or maybe 25 degrees or whichever one you, you want to call it. And based on that, I can say that with, with this ensemble approach of at least two of the methods agree to within a certain uh, tolerance level, uh, it seems that the phase speed at, in that region uh, favors the uh, uh, trapped wave uh, propagation speed rather than the harmonic wave, uh, harmonic phase speed. And obviously, uh, in, in terms of the amplitude, there is no match. The trapped wave theory gives you a structure that is very clearly observed, and the Harmonic wave theory is just saying there and says, no, 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 it should be zero, it should be uniform. Okay, guys, I think uh, I thank you for your attention. And um, that's it, that concludes the first part. Tomorrow, we're gonna hear uh, a lecture by Professor Mariano from the University of Miami. Um, and on Friday, we're gonna go back uh, and look at waves on a sphere, and your title is now settled to be what? Ocean diffusivity tomorrow, and in an hour it's gonna be some thoughts and motion modeling, right? That's not part of the mini course, it's part of the program.